addressing Tanksi, even even though he was very gently in addressing the issue, is because the church in Corinth was simply perceived as an extension of Delphi in, in speaking in speaking tongues. And and I know that we will hear more and more about that. Actually, I want also to su suggest. I talked to Pastor Jim yesterday, and I talked to uh, 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 with with our guides. Uh, both, both ladies um, about possibility it will be a long trip and if you don't mind when you are bored or um, you don't sleep I really want that we have two topics that we deal here here in the bus one would be about biblical hermeneutics another one I want to make connection I want to tell you what is about but I hope that it impact your understanding of the Holy Spirit in the New Testament mm -hmm. so if you if you want it if you don't want they're not interested don't worry i'm not doing that for myself okay so, so my reputation what what she, she said just tell your students to read the book of deuteronomy chapter 11. before i told anything to them i had to read it for myself and my mind was blown away completely so i don't know if you have your bibles if you want to open with me, and believe me, that text has changed everything, everything in my in my in my, in my mind. Okay, I'll just wait until you find. Oh. It's the book of Deuteronomy. It's chapter 11. Please, one more time, if you can keep in mind, it was just across Jordan there, in modern uh, country of Jordan, there on the mountain. As, as Moses would speak to the people of Israel, they could see the promised land. And what could they see? They could see the territory that I just talked to you, Moses. And Moses was aware of that. So he told them, let me read from verse 10. And please, just allow me to interrupt my reading uh, several times. I want to make a comment. We want to make sense of this, of this text. It says, Moses, by the way, if you go to verse 9, for instance, Moses said, so that you may prolong your days on the land which the Lord swore to your fathers to give to them and your descendants a land flowing with milk and honey. And Moses, you know, he pointed finger to the land of milk and honey. Are you still with me? Yes. He knew, he knew what was in the minds of, of, of those people. So Moses immediately wanted to explain to them and it's worth ten. He says, for the land which you are entering to possess it. It's not like the land of Egypt. Can I a little bit paraphrase? It's not like the land of Greece and Turkey. You know what I'm talking about? Did you witness during the whole trip? It's it's like, like paradise, okay? Moses said, sorry, it's not like the land of Egypt. In what way? Palestine is not like the land of Egypt. Please pay attention here. He says, from which you came, where you used to sow your seed, you put seed in the ground, and then what next? You water it with your food, like vegetable garden. What was the difference? He said, when you were there in Egypt, you would put the seed in the ground, and please, this is evidently a metaphoric uh, saying. He said, you use your food, what did you do? With your, with your food, you're bringing the water there, you know, on, 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 on your seed. What is the point? You have a, a plenty, plenty of water there, there in, in, in Egypt. Okay? But Moses said, there is the word, but. But the land in which you are about to cross, and possess it, a land of hills and valleys. Moses recognized it. There is basic difference between Palestine and, and Egypt. Drinks water from the rain of heaven, a land for which the Lord your God cares. The eyes of the Lord your God are always on that land, from the beginning even to the end of the year. What is the difference between Egypt and Palestine? You see, when you are in Egypt, when you are, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. When you are in Egypt, 
All what you need is to use your feet to bring the water there. You do by yourself, and no problem. The problem, uh, uh, the, uh, you will have vegetables as much as you want. Your cattle will, will, will flourish there. But Moses said, in the promised land, you cannot use your food. What can you use? You can use your hand in prayer and look there toward, toward heaven. Is the land, is the land that depends on what? It depends on the rain that comes from heaven. Keep in mind, in this part of the world, and I'm from this part of the world, the rain falls from heaven. In English, we say from the sky, okay? Okay, everything, uh, th there is intentional there. The, in Hebrew, my, there are three heavens. He's telling us that, that the sky, and the universe, and where God dwells are really, really connected, okay? He says, this is the land for which the Lord, your God, cares. All what you can do, what? He turn your eyes there for God. Be obedient, be obedient to him. Do what he asks you to do. It is the land for which the Lord your God cares. This reason is, if you remember, if you go a few chapters later, Moses said to the people of Israel, when you enter the promised land and you get all that wealth there in the land, don't say, my might, my power, my abilities, have provided to me all this wealth. Because it is the Lord, your God, that gives you all these things. Please let me just put one, one footnote here. Are you familiar with the fact that in the Hebrew language, there is no word to have that we can translate as to have? There is no. But because we depend on English translations, that's the reason is we have the word to have. How do how did ancient Hebrew say, for instance, I have a house? They would say, a house to me, children to me, wife to me, wealth to me. They use simply the letter Lamed. They would put in front of the noun, and you know that Hebrew language reads from right to left. Okay, you put it, and this is how, how you read it. Why? You know the language so many times uh, uh, gives us theology, because the Jewish people never believed that they possessed anything. It was given everything by God. That's the reason they would say, you know, this, this, or that, that object, it's, it's to me which means it was, it, was, it was given to me. And that's why Moses, Moses cautioned the people of Israel, when you go to the promised land, don't say my mind, my power provided all these things to me. Remember the Lord your God, as long as you are faithful to him, he will give you the terrain. Okay, so why did God bring the people of Israel to Palestine? Why? I just want to tell you, if I was God, I'll bring to Greece, I'll bring to Turkey, or, or I will lead them there to Egypt and expel the Egyptians out. Am I, am I correct? So why did he bring them in Palestine? There is one obvious reason. Number one, Israel in Palestine was supposed to be God's model to the rest of the people of the earth. What people can achieve, what people can do if they are faithful to God. Yeah. That's number thing. Second thing is, God put the people there in Palestine to teach them their dependence on God. And this concept is very, very important. And you know very well, come on, you're preaching on the pulpit, how many times? When famine comes into Palestine, what happened? That was always, always a curse as the consequences of disobeying the covenant, not being being faithful to God. And probably the best, the best uh, 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 case that we can mention here was at the time of Elijah. You know those three and a half years. By the way, another book that so many times we, we are forgetting is the book of Joel. First there was locust plague 
destroyed everything and after that there was a famine so Joel knew very well God gave him a message to the people of Israel telling them you know chapter 2 priest everybody every ordinary person there go and now repent before God seek God in fasting seek God in your in your prayers and maybe God will come and turn toward you and show your 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 grace grace now you wonder why I mentioned the Holy Spirit please let's just go back and try to read the text okay let me read one more time verse 12 it is the land for which the Lord your God cares the eyes of the Lord your God are always on it from the beginning of the end of the year it shall come about if you listen to obedience to my commandments which I am commanding you today to love the Lord your God and to serve him with all your heart and all your soul that he, he will give the rain for your land in its season the early and the latter rain that you may gather in your grain and your new wine and your oil did you notice something that this is the first occurrence of the expression the early and the latter rain in the bible and i just want just to take a few moments to address about the concept of the early and the latter rain in israel but it's not in israel please correct me if i'm wrong as far as i know i know in my country also in your in your country we have two main season with regard to the rain but in israel this was very specific in israel from march to october is the dry season i lived in israel for three months with seminarians there three months we just had one short shower it lasted probably about 30 seconds in three months there was no rain yeah there is a little bit more rain at the beginning, at the end. But it is the rain season. And what comes between <coughs> are the rains. You know, you know, it is 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 the is the is the season, is the rain, rain season there there in, 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 in Israel. By the way, this is what happened in Palestine. And you see, everything that we are doing here, we want to see. How in the Bible, the greatest doctrines and truth actually are explained by using ordinary things from life. And then God knew how, how we as human beings can understand. So he's using the things that we are familiar with in order to illustrate to us the things that we are not too much familiar or we have difficulty, difficulty to, to, to understand it. It was Joel as the first, first biblical writer who used the concept of the early and the latter reign to communicate, to communicate the biblical teaching of the Holy Spirit. By using this concept of the early and the latter reign, Joel wanted to say to the people of Israel, if you come back to me, to him, if you repent to, before God, okay, you turn back back to God. God will give you the rain season. He will give you the early rain, and He will give you the latter rain. It means He will give you that complete rain rain that you need for your agriculture, that you need for your successful and good life there there in Palestine. I, I hope that this text becomes now very significant and meaningful to you as it has it has to be to, be to me. Can we just talk a little bit? Even there the tendrils. I, two times, two times. I heard the preaching about two comings of the Holy Spirit. How many of you have I don't want to say how many of you preached about that? We have even in the books that you you, 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 you can read two comings of the Holy Spirit. I know about two comings of Jesus Christ. 
Why? Why do we have two comings? Because he came and he left and he will come second time. But do you remember when Jesus made the promise of the Holy Spirit? In Gospel of John, chapter 14 to 16, what did he say? When he comes, he will stay with you forever. There are no two comings of the Holy Spirit. What happened on the day of Pentecost? You know that Peter took Joel's prophecy and he says, this is the fulfillment of the prophet Joel actually actually said. I'm, I'm sorry, I don't want to go into too many details because, because I know we are asleep. But I know that you will go. You will, you will go and further explore, explore this topic. Joel says this is the fulfillment. And he points to the prophecy of Joel. The day of Pentecost in the New Testament marked that, that metaphoric expression of the early rain. And we are waiting for what? For the latter rain. Please keep in mind when you are preaching about the Holy Spirit. And, and the book of Acts indicates very, very clearly the rain, the early rain, was not because of the apostles, except in one instance. When the Holy Spirit came, he empowered the apostles to powerfully preach, preach the gospel. Doesn't make sense to you. But the coming of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost came because of the harvest. Rain is because of the harvest. I, I hope it, it, it makes sense to you. So the early rain help us also to understand the latter rain. So, but I hear so many times people, I'm not good today, I, 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 I am struggling. But then the Holy Spirit comes. Boy, I suddenly have hollow above my, 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 my head. The Holy Spirit is not because of us. You remember the big, before the coming of the Holy Spirit, the disciples, they had to fix their relationship with God. They had to fix their relationship with each other. That was the condition for the early rain. So what is the condition for the latter rain? We have to study the early rain in order to understand what will happen with the latter, latter rain. But I believe the time has come that we stop talking about the two comings of the Holy Spirit. That's not the biblical. The Bible does not talk about that. Because if the Holy Spirit left, I just want to tell you, we are in a big trouble. That's right. That's right. It means that we are left in our own. And please, I, I want to mention now the names here who made that statement. Is that just before the second coming of Christ, the Holy, you know who mentioned the statement, the Holy Spirit will be taken from the earth. And many people think that they have to become sinless because if the Holy Spirit is taken, you're left on your own. That's the reason you have. By the way, yeah, the Holy Spirit will be lifted from the earth, but the Holy Spirit will never be lifted from the faithful. Yes. We will depend on the Holy Spirit all up to the very end when Jesus Christ, Christ comes. Without the Holy Spirit, there is no victory over sin. Without the Holy Spirit, there is no salvation. Without the Holy Spirit, there is no going through this life. And also make that powerful testimony on, the, on behalf of Christ. So I hope that Deuteronomy chapter 11, please, I'm presenting this briefly, almost in the, in the outline four. But I would like you, when you have a time, do you want me to confess to you? I had to read this text from Deuteronomy, I don't know how many times, five, six, seven times. More and more I read, I, I found so many details that, that really impacted my spiritual life, showing me how much we depend on the, on, the, on, the, on the Holy Spirit. And friends, I just want to tell you, you are a pastor in your churches, you can look around yourself, you can see more successful churches, you can see more like what Paul says, brothers, look among yourself. Not too many wise people, not too many capable people. You can look around, but it's not about that. Why did God bring the people of Israel to Palestine? Why? To teach them their dependence on Him. 
that it is not about us. You know how many times when we, 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 is everything is about us. Right. By the way, the, whole, the truth of the Holy Spirit in Deuteronomy 11 is teaching us it's not about us, right. it's about Him. Amen. Amen. And that's what the doctrine of the Holy Spirit really, really points to telling us how much actually in everything what we are doing. And please forgive me and talk as a pastor to my fellow colleagues pastors. I know, I know every every semester when I have two, three, four classes to teach, I, I have soul searching because I know in that semester I really want to see the presence of the Holy Spirit in my classroom. Yes. Yeah, I can say, you see, I'm a scholar, I'm recording a scholar, I, I, I can do this. What, what, what about that? Yeah, you can simply present good idea and say, oh, it was nice, and with that. But if the message that I am giving to my students, and please, I'm talking about my students, I'm talking to pastors, you have your, your class, you have students in your churches, okay? But whatever we're doing, if the Holy Spirit really does not seal that message, leads to the transformation of human heart, then something is wrong. Some, something wrong. It's Apollos in Corinth. You remember we talk about Apollos in Corinth. With, with, with very capable person. So, I, I'm open to any question. Number, number three, all the gifts are important. Although, according to the Bible, there are some gifts that are greater than others. And Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter, chapter 13, he says, he says, struggle for greater gifts. Now, there are some people that are greater. But he says, I will show you something which is much important. I will tell about that what is much more important. Okay. And number four is the spiritual gifts are not for personal edification, but for edification of the church. For for others. That's that's number four. You, you know, you, you remember that in chapter twelve, Paul describes spiritual gifts clearly. Okay, chapter twelve. Chapter fourteen, Paul deals with speaking tongues. But did you notice between chapter twelve and chapter fourteen, there is chapter thirteen. And many people do not see connection between chapter twelve and fourteen, especially they don't see the place of chapter thirteen in the context of spiritual gifts. What's the problem? Please, chapter chapter thirteen change change my perspective of spiritual gifts. I must tell you, I had to do my my soul soul searching about about this. Paul says the last <coughs> verse of chapter twelve, okay? Make effort, strive for greater gifts. I want now to show to you something that's much more important than what is that. Please, can you now cooperate with me? If I speak in the tongues of angels, what is this? Spiritual gift. If I have the greatest spiritual gift of tongues, but if I do not have love, uh, love what is love? Love is not a spiritual gift. It's the fruit of the Spirit. I can even even distribute all my material possession to others. Even to go through the martyrdom. And I just want to tell you, I live in a communist country. There are many people who are fighting against God. But to save the family, they sacrifice their life. You can do it without the Holy Spirit. Paul said, I can have the spiritual gift, but if I don't have love, what is love? The fruit of the Spirit. This is simply my natural talent. This is what I am. Are, are, are you with me? Chapter 13 is very, very significant, telling us that without the fruit of the Spirit, what I perceive as spiritual gift, it's just my, my talent. It's just what, what I am. But doesn't mean that I have a strong relationship with Jesus Christ. And I can I can testify to you, I was a young, a young pastor, and there was some time of ministry when I took my ministry not seriously. 
I had greatest baptism. But really, I, I cannot tell you that during those few months, I had a strong relationship with God and, and, and the Holy Spirit. Sorry, we sometimes have to point, we are all, we are all, 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 all humans, we, we, are, we, we are with that. So, so really, the prerequisite for spiritual gifts is really the fruit of the Spirit. If I, if I preach in, 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 the, in the church and there at the door, nobody tells me how great sermon that I preached today was. I'm sorry. What is that? I, I, I admit, I become so sad, I become offended. I did not preach with my sermon. He's telling me about what? It's not about Holy Spirit. It's about me and my greatness that I want to do. We can talk about that a lot, okay? You can discuss among yourself in groups. But I know how much work God had to do with me. Yeah. ...of the country to the other, from the northeast to the southwest. This, and this uh, waterway is the main route travelers follow when they want to get yes, from yes. one place to the next as fast as possible and with with as few stops as possible and that um, national road which by the way in greek we call ethnic you know the word ethnic greek word uh odos you know the word odos as well so ethnic odos national way national road that's how we call it in greek so uh, this um, main motorway is in many areas of Greece uh, a limited access motorway, a closed highway as we call them in Greece, yeah, in the Europe. The so yeah. there's certain points only where you can get off that road and get back on it. But in other parts of Greece where this modern road is not completed yet, they still use, we still use the older road network and this is such an area as you can tell. So this, in this case we're traveling on the older uh, main network, road network of Greece uh, and uh, we come closer to the mountain in this way. That's why you see we are now in the clouds, there's fog all around us and we are closer to the snow as well so uh, if this <coughs> is an area where we see this much snow because we live in greece this is a lot of snow that we don't get as much snow as you do in many of your states here in our country this is uh, quite a spectacle for us because people like myself who now live in Athens, which is southern Greece, rarely, rarely see snow, so I'm as excited as those of you who love snow are right now, with the snow I'm looking at. So, uh, southern Greeks rarely, rarely see snow. In northern Greece, it's a different story, and also in the mountainous regions of Greece, like this one, of course, they do see uh, this kind of snow more often but still we're always excited we always we always um, are happy and surprised to see this uh, kind of snow and of course this is as high up on the mountain as we come we're now going to begin our descent towards the plain but we're not done with the mountains yet We'll be in the plain, in the area of Lamia, the town of Lamia, L-A-M-I-A, -A, uh, very soon. We'll drive on the on a, another section of the national road for a while there, but then we'll go up the next mountain range. So we have a few more hours of driving to get to Del. Well to get to Delphi and to leave the area of Delphi uh, on the mountains and then we'll drive in the plains again to go to Athens. So 
today, which is, as you know already, the longest day of the Greek portion of this tour. It's a 12-hour day this day because of all the driving and the visiting and the stopping and all that. All together, it's about 12 hours of uh, touring. So um, this day offers a little of everything, as I had mentioned earlier today. Mountains, plains, we'll see views of the Aegean Sea <laughs> and, uh, in a couple of areas. We'll even, if the atmosphere is clear and it's not very, very, very cloudy and humid, we may even be able to catch a glimpse of the Adriatic Sea from the mountains of Delphi. And earlier, of course, Dr. Oranko was uh, talking about the connection or possible connections between Delphi and Corinth, where we'll be, of course, tomorrow. So I have to confirm that, of course, and add to that, that on the de clear days, my friends, when we have a clear horizon and there's no clouds or humidity or uh, 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 anything to get in the way of our view from the shrine of apollo in delphi we can see the adriatic the gulf of, A of corinth in that case and we can see as far as the mountains in the area of corinth so in other words on the days when the atmosphere is clear people who were in corinth in paul's time and today of course can see as far as Delphi and vice versa. Delphi and Corinth are not, as Dr. Ranko said, that far apart. And uh, there was definitely a lot going on between the two cities. <laughs> Ecstatic worship, God bless you, was something that was taking place in both places. Uh, glossolalia, speaking in tongues, also was practiced in both areas, both places. There was a lot, there were many connections between the two, Delphi and Corinth. So, the, um, this small mountain, which is called Othris, my friends, is the one that is the natural border. Once again, we have a mountain serving as a natural border between two provinces. In this case, we are now leaving Thessaly, the province of Thessaly, and entering a new province of Greece in the south, which is called continental Greece. And this is a very large province, almost as large as Macedonia. And it's the province that contains, we could say, both Delphi and Athens, the two places we want to see and go to today. And just as we're leaving Thessaly, let me remind you that the name Thessaloniki comes from or includes the name of this province which is nowadays the granary of Greece because it's got the largest plain in the country, the province of Thessaly. Remember, Thessaloniki, Niki, victory, Nike, mm. means victory of the Thessalians, who were, of course, the Greeks living in the area of Thessaly. Now, why was this name given to the princess of Macedonia, who was the stepsister of Alexander the Great because Alexander's and Thessaloniki's father, Philip II, was a king who had married, according to the custom of those years, six wives. He had taken six wives and his second wife, Olympias, was the one who had given birth to his first son, Alexander. So Alexander was by right the heir to the throne of Macedonia. But uh, later, of course, Philip took more wives, and this was the custom in ancient times because 
every great victory or every important alliance with a neighboring tribe or kingdom was usually sealed by a wedding between princesses or princes or kings and queens of neighboring nations and uh, districts. So when Philip made an alliance with his southern neighbors, the Thessalians, he took their princess as his fourth wife and she gave birth to a girl and that was the girl who was called Thessaloniki, victory of the Thessalians because Philip, with the help of his allies, the Thessalians, won a very important battle against his northern enemies. And then his girl was born, his daughter was born, and he called her Thessaloniki, victory of the Thessalians. And of course, when she grew up, you remember, she became the wife of Cassander, the king who took the throne of Macedonia after Alexander's death. And Cassander was one of the four kings, one of the four horns of the goat in Daniel's prophecy. Now the name Thessaly is Thessalia in Greek, and that's another interesting ancient Greek word because Thessi, the first half of the word, means place. Alia is one of the many ancient words that the Greeks had for the sea. Thessi Alia, Thessalia, which means in the place of the sea. You may remember we talked about that yesterday, my friends, in Meteora, and we said that the plain of Thessaly was thousands of years ago covered by water. It was a small sea surrounded by mountains. Now, I'm sure many of you will say, what is this on our right hand side? I think you can tell many of you this is a gypsy's camp. Yeah, it's a gypsy's camp. One of the few, very few, permanent settlements that we have in our country. As permanent as it can be. For a nomadic people, a wandering people like the gypsies. To the coast uh, for a little while now. We came from the inland. We were in the middle of Greece yesterday and this morning and we have driven, I mean in a few minutes when we'll arrive at the town of Lamia and pass it, we'll have completed two hours of driving and uh, not including of course our stop i'm not including our rest stop i'm talking about just our driving or journey under leonidas who tried to stop the persian invasion of king xerxes or artaxerxes the king you know from the book of esther in the bible who years before he met esther came to Greece and invaded Greece to take revenge for the defeat of his father, King Darius of Persia, by the Athenians 10 years earlier in the famous Battle of Marathon. That is, I'm sure, another name that rings a bell. Maybe some of you are marathon runners. I don't know, maybe you run in marathons in the country uh, you live in or at home and uh, the Greek and Persian Wars my friends are one of the most important historical events of ancient history they started in 490 before Christ and let me add that this classical period of Greek history the 5th century before Christ is exactly the period of Nehemiah and Ezra in the Bible. So you can connect the uh, Old Testament and Greek history. We're talking about the years of Ezra and Nehemiah when the walls of Jerusalem were built again. Mm. So in Greece, other things were happening, different things were happening <laughs> at, the t at that time. So the Persians attacked Greece for the first time in 490 before Christ 
under King Darius who sailed with his fleet from the uh, coast of Asia Minor where you've been to Attica the district the prefecture where Athens is located that's where we'll be in the late afternoon today and he landed at Marathon which is a coastal plain 26 miles north of Athens the Athenian army left the city and marched to Marathon to face the, per face the Persians there. And the Athenians managed to surprise the Persians and they attacked them following the tactics and strategics of a brilliant Athenian general called the, uh, Miltiades. And thanks to his strategics, they managed to envelop the Persians and start pushing them back towards the sea, to the water, back to the water. So thousands of Persians were killed by the sword, thousands drowned in the Aegean during the Battle of Marathon. That was a great unexpected victory for the Athenians. The odds were completely against them. 10,000 Athenians, Herodotus tells us, he's the Athenian historian who wrote the history of the Greco-Persian Wars. He tells us it was 10,000 Athenians against 100,000 Persians. So the Athenians were heavily outnumbered by them, but they managed to defeat the Persians and push them back to the sea. And you may be familiar also, my friends, with the story of the marathon runner, the young Athenian whose name was Phidippides who was ordered after the battle to run to the city as quickly as he could to tell the news to the people who were waiting in agony to hear what had happened in the battle. And of course, this was a young man who had marched with the army from the city to Marathon. He had fought in the battle that had started right away for hours and then in full armor he had to run back to the city to tell the news. A few days earlier, he had run to Sparta to ask for help. The Spartans had replied, uh, no, we will not help you. We're in the middle of a religious festival. We can't engage in warfare. So the young man ran back to Athens to tell the news to the Athenian army. And then he marched, fought in the battle and had to run back to Athens to give them the news. So when he arrived in Athens, exhausted as you can imagine, he managed to whisper one word, nenikikamen, which is ancient Greek for, we have won. And then he dropped dead of exhaustion. That's the famous story of the marathon runner, my friends. And that's the story we commemorate, that's the sacrifice we commemorate every time we run a marathon. So all of you who are maybe athletes or runners or marathon runners even more, even if you were not already familiar with this story, it's important to know that that's what you're honoring. It's his death you're celebrating when you're running a marathon. Here we have the town of Lamia on our right hand side. Uh, this is a, an agricultural and industrial center, the town of Lamia. And even though we can't really see it very well, if you would like to give it a try, if you turn to the right and back a little, at 4 o'clock, let's say, you will see the small Frankish castle of the town, roughly in the middle of the town on that wooded hill. You see pieces of the wall. That's a much later castle. It's late Byzantine. We say Frankish because it was built during or slightly after the Fourth Crusade in 1204, early 13th century. The Fourth Crusade resulted in the conquest of large pieces of land in Greece because the Crus many of these lords and Western European um, Crusaders were not really uh, in the crusade on the crusade for because of their piety and faith, but I'm afraid because they were just greedy and wanted to get land and 
gold. So when the uh, the crusade came as far as this area, when they passed through this area, many of them just conquered a piece of land and remained here and left the crusade. So many small Frankish, and by saying Frankish we're talking mostly French and German knights or lords. Many little Frankish kingdoms grew up in Greece in those years, sprung up in Greece, and one of them was the little kingdom of Lamia, and ha that's why we have a small Frankish castle here. So going on to the with the story of the Greek Persian Wars, ten years later, Darius's son Xerxes returned with an even larger army and a very large fleet. He came from the north. He didn't come across the Aegean Sea. They marched on land across the Dardanelles, where Asia meets Europe, and marched through Thrace and Macedonia and Thessaly, meeting no resistance there. And the first place where they found a small army of Greeks waiting for them to stop them was the narrow pass of Thermopylae, which is not going to be on our way to Delphi. We would have to change our route to go through the area of Thermopylae exactly, but we are not very far from it. We're some miles away from it in this area. So uh, Thermopylae was a narrow pass between the mountains and the sea. And uh, the, this tells you, of course, that the geomorphology of the area in those years was completely different from the present day geomorphology, because as we were driving down the mountain, I pointed at the GMC to you and I showed you the plain and the coastline. This coastline is completely different from the coastline of uh, the fifth, early 5th century before Christ. According to the geologists and the archaeologists, all of this plain which stretches between where we are and the Aegean Sea uh, line is gained land, as they call it. So this was a piece of a body of water that was gradually filled in by deposits and sediments and this uh, plain was created by the sedimentation of the Aegean Sea, of the Gulf of Lamia. In other words, in the time of uh, Xerxes, the sea used to come deeper in the land, deeper in the plain, and closer to the mountains. So the narrow pass of Thermopylae was a very narrow strip of land between the sea, the water, and the mountains. And the Greeks thought that that would be an ideal place where they could take advantage of the geomorphology and force the huge army of Xerxes to attack them in small numbers at the time and it would be an easy place to defend in order to block the Persian invasion and stop them from going further south to Athens and the Peloponnese. And this task was given to Leonidas and 300 of his bravest Spartan soldiers. I'm sure you know that Sparta was the number one military power in ancient Greece. And the Spartans were famous for their bravery and love of their country and their sacrifice, not to mention their skills in war. So when uh, the Spartans arrived, they repaired an old wall which blocked the passage, the pass of Thermopylae. The word Thermopylae itself means the hot gates, my friends, because this was a gate between south and north, and hot because of the hot thermal springs in this area. So straight ahead of us, as we're saying these things, we're looking at the mountain of Thermopylae, my friends. If we continued on this motorway for another let's say 10 minutes and we didn't have to turn to go to the right and head towards Delphi, we would drive through the uh, area of Thermopylae. So 
the Spartans waited for the Persians to arrive and when the Persian army arrived, Xerxes was very surprised to see the Spartans sent, of course, the other Greeks who were with them waiting for him. He, full of arrogance, he sent a message, an order to Leonidas saying, surrender your arms. And Leonidas' his answer is one of the most famous phrases in ancient history, come and get them. So the order was surrender your arms, the answer was come and get them. In ancient Greek, molon lave. And the attack started and for the next few days, the first few days, the Greeks were very successful in repelling the Persian attacks. But then a traitor showed up, my friends, a local man who knew a secret pathway, a secret trail that would take the Persians around the mountain and to the rear of the Greek camp, the Greek army, went to Xerxes and for a very rich reward, led the immortals, the bodyguards of Xerxes, to around the mountain and to the rear of the Greek army. So when Leonidas heard about the immortals who were coming and realized that they were all going to be surrounded and killed, he let go, he dismissed of the rest of the Greeks in his army. He told them to go back to their hometowns and save their lives. And he kept only his 300 Spartans with him. And of course, when the final attack started, they were all surrounded and killed to the last man. After the battle, Xerxes and his entire army marched through the narrow pass of Thermopylae, stepping, literally stepping on the bodies of the dead uh, Greeks, and they invaded the area of Attica and razed the city of Athens to the ground. So we're going to say more about what happened after the Thermopylae tomorrow, my friends, on the way southwest from Athens to ancient Corinth, where we're going, um, sorry, not tomorrow, the day after tomorrow, my mistake. Tomorrow we'll be in Athens and we'll pick up this story and talk about how Athens was raised to the ground by the uh, Persians of Xerxes. And in just a minute or two now, we're going to turn and go up the mountain. If you're still awake, my friends, Keep in mind to look at the view as we'll be ascending in the next, let's say, 10 minutes or so. This uh, winding road that will take us up to the mountain will offer some beautiful views of this area where we are now, and then we'll disappear in the mountain and the view will go too. So let's take a break here. Whoa. Whoa. That one's named Osaka. <laughs> 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 if I check the weather forecast in the morning, around 11 o'clock, it's going to be Exactly. I don't want to just, you know, just look through and go and work Yeah, no, I'd like to have... My take is either snow or no rain. I don't, I don't like rain, but snow feels... of the water until a few minutes ago was afraid I would not be able to show you anything I mean in the surrounding area I was afraid I wouldn't be able to show you the water or the mountains of the Peloponnese across the bay um, but we could 
for a few seconds at least and maybe we'll manage to uh, see the water again a little later we could see it for a few seconds uh, now what body of water is this remember my friends that's the Adriatic that's the Ionian Sea it's the body of water west of Greece because when we are up here on the mountains above Delphi we are facing when we're facing the water southwest that's southwest so there it is one o'clock my uh, friends I hope those of you who are sitting in the middle and the back of the bus are also able to spot it. This body of water is actually the Gulf of Corinth. Mm -hmm. When we'll go to Corinth, we'll, on the way to Corinth, we'll stop at the Corinth Canal and we'll see the point where the Aegean Sea meets the Ionian or, or Adriatic Sea. That's their meeting point at the Corinth Canal. And that's where the Gulf of Corinth starts and goes all the way to this area. It's a rather narrow gulf that after uh, well, about an hour from where we are, an hour and a half, um, is leading to the open Ionian or Adriatic Sea. And from there we can sail as far as Italy. So uh, the mountains that we are able to see just barely on the other side of this body of water are the mountains on the north coast of the Peloponnese. If you happen to have seen a map of Greece before the journey or if you have a map in your things or in your books, if you just take a look at the map of Greece you can tell that uh, from the area of Delphi, if of course you can spot Delphi in the map, uh, you have a view of the Pel northern coast of the Peloponnese. And by the way, if there's someone who would like during their journey to take a look at a map of Greece and you don't happen to have one right here with you or you don't happen to have it on your cell phone, I always carry with me, my friends, my map of Greece if you are map people like I am and I'll be happy to give it to you so you can take a look and uh, of course show you where Delphi is or other places we've been to but of course the cell phones help very much too with these things so there now once again straight ahead of us we see the water and the mountains on the other side, that, that piece of land beyond the water is the Peloponnese region, the southernmost region of Greece, which has a very distinctive shape. When we look at it in a map of Greece, it looks like a hand with four fingers rather than five. And those four fingers are the thumb in the area of Corinth and three fingers pointing south towards Africa. So the uh, other people, other geographers, compare the Peloponnese region to uh, the design, I mean the shape of the Peloponnese, to that of a mulberry leaf, or even to that of a fig leaf. I usually think of it as a hand, a palm with four fingers. So we'll say more about that on the day of Corinth. We'll say how the ancient people were uh, really afraid of this round trip of the Peloponnese the, whenever they had to go around sail around the Peloponnese they were terrified because of the dangerous waters in the southern part of this province but uh, we can see we can see from here uh, the mountains of the North Peloponnese and uh, if people who were in Delphi looked across the water and a little to the left so east they could see the coast of Corinth from a distance that's why that's what we uh, said earlier that they were closely connected with the ecstatic and prophetic practices and cults they uh, had in both places and the um, speaking in tongues, worship, 
that uh, used to take place in uh, Corinth and is linked to the prophetic utterings of the Pythia in uh, Delphi and of course as uh, we heard from Dr. Ranto earlier uh, or actually it was sorry maybe it was Pastor Jim who mentioned that this morning that um, in the original Greek text of the book of Acts of the Apostles where the adventures of Paul in Philippi are described the text says that the slave girl that kept following them around in Philippi was possessed by a Pythonic spirit a spirit of the Python and the Python was the serpent the dragon we could also say who according to the Greek mythology was the guardian and original um, owner we could say of the land of Delphi which was uh, shot by Apollo Apollo killed the python with his arrows and left his body to rot in the sun so from the ancient Greek verb which means to rot which was pitho the serpent was called python and the original very ancient name of Delphi was Pytho. Delphi was called Pytho before it was called Delphi. So uh, we are uh, still like 25 or so 30 minutes away. Let me if you don't mind try to take advantage of this time as we are now closing to the flatter areas. Look at this <coughs> lovely village on the left side. This is one of my favorite villages in all of Greece. It's so picturesque and such a nice setting, surrounded by olive groves, cypress trees, the tall slender trees behind it are cypress, and the mountains in the background. By the way, my friends, this mountain range of Parnassus, we're now, we're coming from Parnassus and we're descending, but we'll drive up to the south side of the mountain in just a few, uh, in a few minutes again. So Parnassus is full of the ore that we call bauxite. Maybe if you were um, looking outside your windows earlier, you had noticed signs on the right side of the road that said drives 300 to 400 or bauxite, bauxites of Parnassus and so on. That's, that area was where the headquarters of the company that mines the bauxite in this area are located. And uh, bauxite, as I was saying, is an ore. It's the ore that gives us aluminum we get aluminum or aluminium as we call it from bauxite so this is the largest industry in this area the bauxite industry and that's why we see so many heavy trucks mm. carrying the bauxite when we drive on that winding road but now we're done for a while at least with the mountains we're back in the plain for a while and you see we're surrounded by olive trees in this area straight ahead of us now we see the town that's the largest town in this area the provincial let's say or prefectural capital it's called Amphisa A M F I S S A. Ooh, very strong winds in this area. You can feel the bus moving a little. And coming up on our right hand side, my friend, you see um, a cement canal, a cement line that comes down from the hillside. That's an aqueduct, my friends. Higher up on the mountains west of Delphi 
in an area that is often called the Switzerland of Greece because it's all tall mountains. The uh, governments back in the 1960s had built a dam to collect water and there's a very large water reservoir higher up on those mountains. So this aqueduct on the right hand side now carries the water from that water reservoir which is too far for us to see behind the mountains all the way to Athens. Mm. The governments of the past have done a lot of things to make sure that the people who live in Athens remember five million people in the metropolitan area of Athens will always have plenty of water. And of course, we must not forget in the summertime the population doubles because of our, the travelers and the tourists. So here's Amphisa on our right. Uh, Amphisa is uh, what usually English speaking people say. And look at all the olive groves all around you, my friends. This is the largest olive grove in Greece, according to the uh, uh, locals. And they claim that there's as many as 10 million olive trees in this area. Some are very old. I'm sure you know from your time in Turkey or other parts of the world where olive trees are so popular and plentiful that the olive trees live for a very long time they can live for thousands of years sometimes there's a few places in Greece where olive trees that are 2,000 years old are still there and still producing they're huge trees huge trees from the time of Jesus it's just crazy to think about it and in some of, uh, well, even in this area, there's some olive trees that are a thousand years, 800 years old, and they've got very thick, huge bodies, huge trunks. And that's how we can tell usually the age of the olive tree from the size, by the size of their trunk. So, um, uh, maybe I'm talking about things you already know, but let me just add that the olives are picked not by hand, really. Uh, at least in Greece, what they do is they put nets or fabrics on the ground and they beat the olive trees with uh, sticks and the olives fall in these nets and that's how they are harvested. And of course, if there are a few still on the trees after that, they do hand hand pick them and uh, of course in case you don't know this because often people ask are there different kinds of olives no my friends it's one kind of olive tree one kind of olives but you can get different varieties and kinds of olives because of the water you use in each area to water the trees and because of the minerals and ingredients in the earth in the soil so what decides if you get a green olive or a black olive or a soft olive or a hard olive is the conditions, the environment, the climate, the water, the soil. There's no different kinds of trees, it's one kind of tree. But it's up to all these things. And of course the most famous olives in Greece from Greece are the Kalamata olives from the name of the town of Kalamata, which is south, south, south in the Peloponnese, one of the southernmost towns in mainland Greece. But the Delphi olives are very famous too, my friends, and later when we'll go to lunch, if you are a person who likes olives, they're so good for us, you know that, I'm sure, like the olive oil, if you are a person who likes olives, you can take the opportunity and try some of the Delphi olives at the local restaurant where we'll have a lunch later, of course. So, well, we can go on about these things uh, for a while, but we uh, need to share a few things about Delphi and uh, some mythology and some history. So you will be prepared 
with this information when we will arrive at the museum and site and in this way I will not have to keep you uh, standing for a very long time and we'll be able to move pretty fast and keep the guided tour short and pleasant and in this way give you more free time to explore and so on. You see how beautiful the area is with the yellow mustard seeds. These are so beautiful, these flowers. And you can tell, I think, that they had a fire in this area recently. You see, some of the trees have been uh, burned or touched by the fire, like here on the left. This was a small fire last summer, my friends. But, uh, well, more than, sorry, not last summer. It was the summer before that, so about a year and a half ago, if I'm not wrong. And this is where we turn again to go up the mountain that's on our left. Straight ahead of us, there's a small village that's not Delphi. Delphi is the village just above that one, which we will see very, very soon. So that's where we're heading. And uh, this gives me just enough time to prepare you. So Delphi, what is the meaning of the name? It's like Philippi, my friends. It's plural. In Greek, we would spell it Delta, Epsilon, Lambda, Phi, Omicron, Iota. D-E-L-F or P-H, it's the same, O-I. In Koine Greek, you would read Delphoi. But for us, O and I are a diphthong. They are pronounced together and they produce an E sound. Mm. So we say Delphi in Greek. Delphi. Delphi. So that's the plural of the surname Delphos. Oh, here it comes. The sun. Doo -doo -doo -doo. <laughs> that's beautiful. It's a completely different weather on this side of the mountain range, you see, my dears. We're so blessed. So Delphi is plural for Delphos, and Delphos was one of the many epithets and surnames of the god Apollo, one of the most popular among the Olympian gods and goddesses. Apollo, according to the Greek mythology, was the son of Zeus, the king of the ancient uh, gods, among the gods, the, and king of the world. And uh, a mortal woman called Leto, who was seduced by Zeus and uh, gave birth to two uh, babies, two twins, Apollo and Artemis, or Diana in Latin, the huntress goddess of the night. And you know, of course, all about Diana in, from Ephesus, even though there she was honored under a different, let's say, name and with different powers and qualities. In most places in ancient Greece, she was a huntress, a virgin goddess who, was, who protected the hunters. So Apollo was the god of light and music and prophecy and justice and a number of other things, but above all, light and uh, music and prophecy. So, Delphi was his uh, territory, his, uh, we would say, kingdom. According to the Greek mythology, it was first the earth goddess Gaia who owned this land. She gave it as a present to her daughter, the titaness Phoebe. Phoebe gave the land of Delphi as a present to Apollo. And Apollo had to kill the python, the dragon who guarded this land, in order to take possession of it. And once he had done that, he established his most famous sanctuary in this area and his famous oracle, the most uh, influential and well-known oracle in the ancient Mediterranean world, or Greek at least world. And of course, a parenthesis here, as we're saying these things, we are ascending again, as you see. And uh, here and there, there will be...
would be beautiful views, panoramic views of the plain and the olive groves. So kindly stay alert, my friends, not to miss these beautiful views. You'll have opportunities to take some nice pictures, but you have to stay alert because uh, it's only a few seconds that we have every time. This is not the kind of road where we can pull on the side of the street and take time for pictures or slow down easily. So, don't miss my friends, the views, and uh, as far, when we can see as far as the water, right on the water, you will be able to see a small port town which is nowadays called ITEA, I-T-E-A, ITEA is what we say in Greek, and that's the uh, town which is right there where the ancient port of Delphi used to be. So, uh, the reason why it's uh, good to know that Delphi which was on the mountain range, on the mountain side, sorry, used to have a port as well, is that in those ancient times, what the archaeologists and historians believe is that most of the visitors who came to Delphi came by boat, traveled in the sea, which was in general considered a safer journey. A sea journey was considered safer than the land journey because the countryside was full of bandits and thieves. So we believe that the majority of the travelers and uh, visitors would come by ship. They would disembark at the little port town of Aitia, which I will have the chance to point out to you in just a few minutes. And then they would make their way up to the mountain and to the sanctuary of Apollo in Delphi. This would be about a day's journey for most of them, maybe half a day's journey if they were on a carriage or a horse or a donkey. And they would of course arrive at the area where we are going to visit the excavation. So the beautiful view is uh, coming up on our right hand side, the small bay is the Bay of Idea. So there, my friends, on the right-hand side now, whenever there's no oleanders getting in the way of the view, like here, you see the olive groves, you see the Bay of Idea and the little settlement, the little port down. There's another opportunity in a few seconds that's where the port of ancient Delphi used to be and they would travel from there up the mountain and to the shrine of Apollo and remember the opposite coast is the Peloponnesian coast now right next to us on our left hand side here you see this cement wall this is still the aqueduct my friends we're following for a while the route of the aqueduct. It disappears under the street right in front of us and it reappears on the right. So if you'd like, take a look to the right as we're approaching and you'll see the water running in the channel in this aqueduct. In this area, it's not covered up so you can see the water right next to us here on our right. <coughs> It's just gravity that they use that moves the water and it goes all the way to Attica where we will end up today and to the area of Athens. They process it, they clean it and we use it in Athens. By the way, tap water in Delphi as well as in Athens is 100% safe. In fact, the area of Delphi gets its water it's water from natural water springs and it's one of the best kinds of water you can drink. Drink the, You can drink the water of Delphi, tap water from Delphi, without any worry. It 
it's actually good therapeutic water because of the minerals it contains. So going back to our mythological stories, uh, we, it's important to understand how influential, how intense the uh, honor of the ancient gods was here in Delphi and especially Apollo. It's important to understand, my friends, the extent of his power and prestige. Delphi was the most important oracle, the most famous and influential and powerful oracle in the ancient Greek world. People would come here from the colonies, from the islands, from other countries, not Greek countries. Foreign people, barbarians would come here to consult Apollo in Delphi. The ancient Greeks called them barbarians, not because the word had the same meaning it has today, but because the strange languages that these people used to speak sounded to Greek ears like bar, 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 bar. <laughs> so they called everyone who was not a Greek speaking person a barbarian. <laughs> so in those years, my friends, the word did not have a negative meaning. It just meant not a native Greek speaker. So uh, barbarians, foreigners, would come to this area every day to consult the oracle. So it's important for us to know the background of these people, know what they believed in. That's why I'm sharing these uh, mythological stories with you. So these people believed that Apollo had taken possession of this land after the murder of the python, the serpent, and he himself had established the oracle and had chosen the first Pythia, the first prophetess. This is actually a surprise for misogynist Greece, the fact that the priestess, the prophetess was a woman, a female, the Pythia. Her name, of course, came from the name of the python. And Apollo, according to the legend, arrived at Delphi from the sea. One last time, we have this beautiful view on our right. This is even better, we could say, because we are higher up now. So Apollo arrived from this body of water, the, from the sea, uh, the first time he came to Delphi, according to the ancient myths. And he was riding on the backs of dolphins. It was dolphins that brought Apollo to Delphi, the legend says. And that's why this place was called Delphi. Apollo, Apollo's, one of the uh, sacred animals of Apollo was the dolphin. That's a Greek word, delphini. In English, it's dolphin, but it's a word of Greek origin. So Apollo Delphos means Apollo of the Dolphins. And the plural of Delphos is Delphi. That's the chain that you have to uh, follow. Delphini, Dolphin, is the sea creature that brought Apollo to this area. Because of that, Apollo was named Apollo Delphos, Apollo of the Dolphin. And in plural, Delphos gives us Delphi or Delphi, as English-speaking people usually say. That's why this land was called Delphi after Apollo's arrival. And uh, of course, when we say the word oracle, sometimes people say, what is that exactly? I'm sure you all know that we can use this word in three with the, three different meanings, we could say. Oracle is the place where divinations, prophecies are spoken in antiquity. Uh, it can be a cave, it can be a temple, it can be an open air area. Oracle is also the person, the prophet or prophetess, who delivers the prophecies, the divinations. And also oracle is the spoken word, the uttering that uh, the prophet or prophetess deliver under the influence of the deity. So the oracle of Apollo here was 
uh, as far as location goes, inside a secret underground room in the temple that was built for Apollo. The Persian oracle was a woman, the Pythia. Actually, there were three Pythias, and they took turns, we could say, when the time came for them to deliver their prophecies. And as far as the utterings go, the oracles of Apollo were famous for their oblique and ambiguous nature, my friends. I'm sure you know that the uh, oracles of Apollo, the utterings of the Pythia, under Apollo's influence or in her ecstasy, when she was filled by the spirit of Apollo as they believed in those years, she cried out inarticulate cries, unintelligible things that no one could understand but the priests of Apollo who interpreted what the Pythia was saying in her ecstasy and they wrote it down on small clay tablets and these were the oracles that were given to the inquirers, the person, the people who asked the questions. We'll say more about that my friends later. This is now the small town of Delphi it's still the beginning of the traveling season, but usually, my friends, this town is crazy busy, it's really crowded. It's all hotels and restaurants Ooh. and gift shops because it's a very touristy place, but it's still a lovely and pleasant town with just a couple of thousand people. And, uh, it may be interesting for you also to know that Delphi is the second most visited site on the mainland of Greece. Number one is the Acropolis of Athens. Number two, Delphi on the Greek mainland. So here comes the beauty, the natural beauty. Take a look to the right, look at this valley. We look at the valley of the river Clistos. We can't see it, but there is a river down there. And we will first pass the small museum and stop the bus in front of the archeological site where we'll start because the weather is so nice. We'll start in the outdoor area of the excavation. So my friends, kindly lend me your ears so I can explain to you how this tour is going to run. This is an area where you see we have limited space. It's a narrow street, only two lanes. The only area where our buses can stop and wait for us for five, 10 minutes is this area in front of the museum. So this is where later we will get back on our bus. But in order to save us the walk from the museum to the excavations, Andreas is now going to drop us off in front of the entrance of the archaeological site. That's where we'll start. So when you get off the bus in a few minutes, make sure you have everything you'll need for the next roughly two hours that we're going to spend here. We'll start, yes please, headsets are a must have. And also you must, you please, you must bring your headset with you. And, and also, yes, please. The boundaries of the Oracle of Apollo, the sanctuary, the sacred area of uh, the Oracle. And in this area, just outside the main entrance to the sanctuary, we find the remains of a small marketplace. This was a small agora or forum. These are shops. These rooms you see are shops arranged one next to the other behind a small colonnade, as you see. And you may remember the Greek word for this kind of building, stoa, S-T-O-A. This is what the Greek would call a stoa. So 
I still was one of the most popular building buildings in a forum area or in a marketplace in Agora and they would enter between the openings uh, through the openings between the columns and go to the shop which were selling different things this is a late Roman period store from around 250-300 AD so it wasn't in use for a long time because a little later with Constantine's conversion this place stopped functioning and actually uh, uh, some decades later during the time of Theodosius the one remember who decided that Christianity was going to be the state religion in the empire no other religion would be tolerated uh, Theodosius sent his troops his soldiers to Delphi and they destroyed the place and closed it down and locked it up in order to put an end to pagan practices in this area which were still and in an underground way going on the people were holding on we could say to their old uh, pagan gods it was hard for them i guess to give them up after hundreds and hundreds of years of believing in them so it took this kind of let's say force to establish the uh, christian the, fa uh, the christian faith in this area so the christians tried to christianize the area and they turned some of these small rooms which were formerly shops into little chapels and that's why in some of them there were niches like that small one on the right side opened in the wall and they used them as altar areas in the little chapels they built in the ruins of this um, older market now before we uh, take a few more steps my friends let me tell you that these two rocks that are rising above the shrine of apollo in delphi are called the fedriades which means the shining rocks because of the way they reflect the sunlight when the sun is in the sky not right now i'm afraid and between the two rocks there's a ravine there's a gorge and that's where the sacred water spring of delphi is running from the mountains the spring is running down this gorge and it's the famous spring that was called castalia the castalian spring whose waters were believed to have divinatory powers, prophetic powers. So the Pythia, as we'll say with more detail later, had to go through a certain ritual in order to be able to deliver the prophecies. And one of the conditions, one of the things she had to do to prepare herself for the prophecies was to bathe herself in the spring, in the waters, and bring some of the water of this spring to enhance her prophetic ability as they believe and something that has nothing to do with these prophecies and ecstatic worships i just want to say for the sake of information because i know how much you know and uh, i think i know how much you know uh you're definitely as i was saying earlier to some of you uh uh, much above the average, let's say, uh, groups we uh, usually have. So you may have heard of Aesop, the writer of the fables, the famous fables of Aesop. Now, Aesop made the mistake to mock the Delphian people in a few of his fables. He called them lazy and told them that they lived off the god, which was of course true because they were making a lot of money from the thousands of pilgrims and believers who came here. And when he made the mistake some years later to travel through their land, they arrested him and condemned him to death. And they took him to the top of this rock just behind us and gave him a little push. Oh, him a little push. No. I know it sounds gross, but this is how they executed people condemned to death in this area of Delphi. In other places, they had different methods. In Athens, they gave them the hemlock, like what happened to Socrates, among others. Here, they just took them up there and gave them a little push. So, <laughs> 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 it's a sad story because it's, it's just crazy to uh, hear that a, a brilliant writer that, like 
Aesop whose fables are still shared ab among children especially and make wonderful stories for children because there's always uh, a teaching, a moral in these stories had such a tragic uh, end. Uh, so earlier, my friends, we talked about the origin of the word Delphi. I'd like to share with you also an alternative uh, theory. Uh, so probably, or maybe, the word comes from the Greek word Delphini, Delphi. Another explanation which agrees maybe a little more with our beliefs uh, as Christians and the word brother and sister that we so often use for our uh, brothers and sisters in Christ is that the and this is true of course and you can it's one or the other even the experts on languages cannot tell the um, womb of a woman was called in ancient Greek Delphis, Delphis, so, and from that word Delphis for the womb, we have the word Adelphos, brother, and Adelphi, sister. So another explanation for the name of Delphi is that it comes from this word, and you know because this is a word that we also use. It's interesting to know that. Don't forget, you use this word in English as well. You have cities like in Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. So that's an important word to know. And possibly the name of this area came from that word. Now, as we go up the steps, we enter the area that was sacred and was surrounded by a low perimeter wall. This is of which you see on your right and also a little and I'll keep my voice down like to disturb the other travelers. I hope you're able to hear me. We are following the route of what they call the Sacred Way, which was a paved pathway. I will ask you please to be careful, of course, where you step, because it's easy to trip. It's not a very flat and easy to walk on area. And a little later, I will show you the original pavement of this sacred way. And that's, of course, the English translation of the ancient Greek words Hiera Odos. Hiera Odos. Sorry, there's a ticket on the ground. Make sure it's not one of yours, my friends. Make sure you can put your hand on your ticket because you will need it at the museum. You will not be able to go inside the museum if you don't have your ticket. So uh, I was telling you that Hiera Odos is Greek for sacred way. And this was the paved road that the visitors to Delphi followed in order to go up this winding path and uh, arrive at Apollo's temple where the oracle was located. As we go higher and higher, of course, the view gets better and better. And if anyone is wondering what are these blocks of marble and stone on the left and right side of the uh, pathway we're walking, these are pedestals and niches were statues that were offered as presents to Apollo used to stay. So if you were a visitor to this area in the um, ancient Greek times or even in the time of Paul, my friends, as you would be walking on this sacred way, you would be able to see hundreds of monuments and works of art, like statues of course as well, standing on the side of this uh, pathway, this paved way leading to Apollo's temple. When you arrive at the top of this ramp, you find yourself walking on the original pavement. This is marble, this is the marble pavement from the first century uh, a I'm not going to. It only survives. 
in certain areas. <laughs> And it is the original. So this is no, 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 a good idea of how it used to be. And this is the area where we pause for a few minutes to look around and point out a few of the monuments. Uh, I would like only to ask you to make sure you're not standing in anybody's way. We're not alone here. We have to allow some space for people, for other people who are walking up and down. So kindly make sure you're doing that. So my friends, another important myth from Delphi tells us that Delphi was believed to be the center of the world, the navel of the earth. In those, Greeks, in those years, the Greeks and other people believed that the earth was flat. They imagined the earth as a flat disk surrounded by a large river called the ocean. And they imagined that Delphi was right in the center of this flat disk. How did they know? The mythology gives us the answer again. They said that Zeus, the king of the gods, had let loose two eagles from the two ends of the world and the two sacred birds had flown and had met above Delphi. Mm. And the spot on the ground where the two eagles had fallen was marked by Zeus with a stone that had a very special shape and this stone right here which looks like half of an egg we could say is a replica of the original stone which is of course mythological but that's how they imagined it and that stone was called the omphalos the navel the belly button of the world omphalos is to this day the greek word for belly button O-M-F-A-L-O-S, Omphalos. And that's actually the name of the local restaurant where we'll have lunch later. <laughs> so that's uh, what this thing is. This is one of the many, many replicas of the navel stone which marked the center of the world. And it was a very popular present when people would come to, re to consult the oracle, sometimes rather than offering a statue of Apollo or a beautiful vase as a present to the god, they would make replicas of the navel stone and put them on the side of the sacred way where people on their way to the temple could see them and uh, admire all these dedications and presents. Mm -hmm. uh, another important thing to talk about here is this building right in front of us. This is one of the many, many treasuries we find in Delphi. This was a characteristic of all the Panhellenic shrines. Another place like Delphi was ancient Olympia, where the Olympic Games used to take place. Mm -hmm. And that's south of here in the Peloponnese. That was what we would call a Panhellenic sanctuary. It wasn't a place where only the local people of that area went to honor the gods and celebrate. It was a place that welcomed Greeks from all around the world. The same thing is true about Delphi. And it's important for us to understand that in order to grasp the importance of Delphi. Delphi was visited by Greeks and other people from all around the then known world. And they would all come with offerings and often entire cities would pay to erect these kind of buildings that we call treasuries because they served a double purpose. The building itself was the dedication of the people living in that city. At the same time, when they also brought valuable presents as pre uh, for Apollo, they would keep them locked inside these buildings safe from the thieves. So these buildings were full of lavish and expensive gifts for the god. That's why they were called treasuries. This one is the treasury of Athens, my friends. It's the most prominent of all the treasuries here. Most of them are in the condition the ruined one behind you here on the left is. You see, just the foundations. Treasury of the Boeotians. Thank you. Thank you for pointing it out. So most of the treasuries are in this ruined condition because of the terrible earthquakes and of course the final destruction of this site in the 4th century AD. The only monument we have restored so far in all of Delphi is this one, the Athenian treasury, 
The reason is that they had all the material just lying around, so the temptation was too big to restore and re-erect this uh, small building. And it's the only treasury that was made out of marble, rather than the local limestone from Mount Parnassus. That was because the Athenians wanted to show off. They wanted everybody to know that they were the most powerful city-state in all of Greece. So they brought marble from their territory, piece by piece, and used it to build the Athenian treasury in order to impress everybody. The date of this treasury, my friends, is 500 before Christ. Even maybe a little le earlier, maybe a little later. Roughly 500 before Christ. So I was just waiting for the group that was moving to go ahead. Let's follow them now, my friends. We go a little further up the steps. <laughs> it's possible. And we'll uh, now walk slowly and carefully to the terrace, the area where Apollo's temple was located. And that's where the oracle used to be. Another thing you may find interesting to know about the treasury of the Athenians, now that you come closer to its south wall, my friend, you'll see that the marble blocks of this uh, wall are all covered with writing. Look at that. Can you see the lines of the text? These are different texts. More than 400 different texts have been found carved in marble on the walls of the Athenian treasury. Most of them are honorific decrees, honoring citizens of Athens. Some of them are the Athenian That's why some of the blocks of marble are missing up there, because among these texts, we found three hymns to Apollo, which are very, very well preserved, and the main reason they are important, and that's why they are on display in the museum, rather than here on the wall, is that between the lines of the text of these hymns, we can see the musical notation. So this is a musical score, an ancient musical score, you can't see it here, you'll see it in the museum later, my friends. They moved it there to preserve it and protect it. And uh, from the point of view of the historians and archaeologists, that's a very important discovery because ancient Greek music is almost completely unknown to us. It's very important when we find musical scores that are almost intact and thanks to this musical score here in Delphi they were actually able to reproduce the melody, the tune and actually this hymn was performed at the opening ceremony of the first modern Olympic Games in 1896, more than a hundred years ago. So this was a very important discovery. Now, my friends, we are passing here on our left hand side the Rock of Sibyl, as it is called. This is one of the most famous things to see in Delphi. It's this rock, which is probably a boulder that rolled down from the mountain at some point in time. And you see ivy growing at its bottom. The local legends say that this is the rock where the most ancient prophetess in Greece, Sibyl, stood to prophesy. This is all traditions and uh, legends and myths, of course, but the Delphians considered this rock very, very important. The Sibyl, yes, please. On the, on this. Uh, the temple here? Uh, the treasury, yeah, yes. The treasury, the, uh, the laurels looked almost exactly the same. Are they stamps? They almost look like... They don't they, look like... They have been carved. But they look all, they're like identical. Like each one looks exactly the same size, exactly yes. the same. It's mm -hmm. not like a... That was probably the standard for the years when they were, those texts were carved. Okay. And the, 
There's no okay. significance to that as far as we can tell. Okay. Right. But uh, the laurel, by the way, thank you actually for pointing that out because I forgot to mention, my friends, that the laurel tree or bay tree was sacred to Apollo. And this is why we have a lot of bays in this area. And we see the a lot no, of no, laurel. Baby. No, right. Ma se vuoi che vi Apollo and when we find busts or statues of Apollo we see that he's often presented wearing a laurel wreath. Also every four years excuse me, they um, celebrated the Pythian Games. And the athlete that won the contests in the Pythian Games received a wreath uh, made of laurel. That was the only, as you know, in the same way that in the Olympic Games they received a wreath of olive. <laughs> And when we'll go to Corinth, we'll talk about the wreath that they received there, which was different. You probably know what it was made of, but I'll save that for the day of Corinth. I'm pausing again because I'd like to invite you to take a look to the right oh, and look at the valley. As you're looking at the valley on the left side, my friends, mm -hmm. you see two more small excavations. Those are also important because especially the one on the right hand side where you see the three columns they have restored which are holding up a piece of the trees that those columns that's a very important place because that was where another deity who was very popular in antiquity athena was honored the goddess of wisdom minerva in latin and that those three columns belong to a small rotunda, a small round building which was not a temple but to this day remains a mystery we don't really know why that particular building was round rather than the usual square or rectangular uh, shape of ancient temples and that the greek word for rotunda is tholos t-h-o-l-o-s tholos so that monument the tholos of delphi is the most famous monument in delphi if you google delphi the first picture you get is of those three big columns of the Tholos. Not of Apollo's temple or the Athenian treasury. The most famous thing in Delphi is that one because of the fact that it's extremely rare to have rotondas in ancient Greco-Roman architecture. Rotondas are extremely rare. We don't know why it was built as a rotonda rather than an ordinary rectangular temple. But it's one of the mysteries of Greek archaeology, but it is the most famous monument. And also left of that is another area of walls and ruins, my friends. This was the gymnasium, the training center for the athletes who participated in the Delphic Games. The Delphic Games were Pan-Hellenic, like the Olympic Games. Greeks from all around the Mediterranean world would come here to compete. Yes, dear. Yes, perfectly. Thank you. That was going to be the next oh, thing. Sorry. Not a problem. Not a problem. So, my dears, now as we go a little further up, we come closer to this impressive wall on your left, which we call the polygonal wall. And it's really just a retaining wall, which is holding up the next terrace where the Temple of Apollo was constructed. It provides a solid base for the Temple of Apollo. What you pointed out is exactly what's worth noticing, how perfectly these irregularly cut stones have been fastened without any mortar or other binding agent. It's just stone on stone, limestone. And there's a famous second century travel writer called Pausanias, whose journal on his journeys in this area mm -hmm. is an invaluable source of information for archaeologists. He tells us that he tried to put a knife between two of the stones and he failed. They were so perfectly placed and fastened, he wasn't able to do that. Now, again, you see writing everywhere, everywhere. More than 800 different texts have been found on this wall. 
Some are, like in the case of the Athenian Treasury honorific decrees, some are regulations of boundaries, some are peace treaties. So we understand that this wall served as a kind of bulletin. It was where they would put the announcements, the news of the uh, era. When, so when people would come for the festivals, they would read the text and they would know what was happening in the country. Mm. And let's turn the corner to see Apollo's uh, temple, or at least the remaining pillars of Apollo's temple. And then you have some way back to take pictures and make your way back to the gate, which will be a meeting place. That gate close to where they uh, scan your tickets. And uh, I was about to say earlier, my friends, when I showed you the rock of Sibyl, that the Sibyl of Delphi, as those of you who may have been to Rome and to the Sistine Chapel know, must know, excuse me, is painted, was painted by Michelangelo in the Sistine Chapel in uh, Rome. So it was a very, uh, the Sibyl of Delphi was still, let's say, uh, remembered and popular and uh, honored. It was a story that was still alive, still famous in the time of, in the years of Michelangelo. So as we arrive at the top of the steps, on our left hand side we have this grayish marble structure which was the main altar to Apollo. This is where the animal sacrifices, here on our left, yes. This is where the animal sacrifices used to take place. And according to the ancient writers, usually the visitors offer a goat for sacrifice. The animal was gathered on the altar. And then the person who had offered the sacrificial animal would be taken up this ramp and inside the temple of Apollo, which was located here. It's the most prominent of all the buildings in Delphi, as you will see later also in the museum where I'll show you a painted reconstruction of this entire area. And inside the temple of Apollo, there was an antechamber in the front where on the walls they had carved some of the most famous ancient Greek proverbs like know thyself or nothing in excess and others. And then they would, uh, be, after the vestibule, after the entrance hall, there was the main cella, the main room where the cult statue of Apollo was located and underneath that room was the secret underground chamber where the inquirer was taken that's where the Pythia was that's where the oracle was and according to the descriptions of the ancient visitors and writers in the ground of that small room there was a chasm from which vapors emanated and the Pythia sat on a pretty strange throne, which was a tripod. I'll show you. You'll see rather than what a tripod is in the museum. It's like a big pod, a big cauldron, standing on three legs, three supports. So she sat on her oracular tripod, which was a present by Apollo. And that tripod had oracular div divinatory powers as well. She sat on the tripod, she inhaled the vapors, she munched laurel leaves, she drank the water of the spring, and she fell in a trance and cried out in articulate cries that no one could understand but the priests of Apollo, who were the ones who interpreted her words and wrote them down on small lead tablets, and these were given to the person who had asked the question. So the question was asked orally, the answer was given in writing, my friends. And as we said briefly earlier, we can say more if you want on the bus when you'll be sitting down again and you'll be more comfortable. The oracles were always very oblique. That's why Apollo was called Apollo Loxias, Apollo the Oblique, 
because it was often said that people left this area more troubled and mystified than they were when they first mm. arrived because Apollo's oracles did not really help them very much. It was sometimes impossible to understand what the god was telling them or advising them to do. And of course, centuries later, uh, most of the historians and archaeologists believe that the uh, priests of Delphi always were very careful with the wording of the oracles to make sure that it would be phrased and expressed in such a way that no matter what the interpretation you would give, the god would always be right. <laughs> he had to protect the authority of the god. For money's sake. For money's sake, of course. So my friends, this is as far as we go with the guided tour. If you're still full of energy, you can go from this side or past the temple and go up from that side. There's a small theater at the next level, which is where they had the poetic and musical and theatrical contests. You can go and take a look at the theater and, of course, see the view, which is even better from there. And then I will ask you please to turn around and head back to the gate. And uh, for the sake of taking you to lunch not much later than 2 o'clock, I will ask you please to be uh, downstairs at the gate.
details are going to point out only the most important things to you and um, those will be the painted reconstruction of the shrine of Apollo in Delphi which is close to the entrance to the museum and then we'll let you go through the museum which is a teeny tiny museum on your own and we will be waiting for you at the exit near the exit of the museum where we will show you the most important exhibit of the Delphi Museum especially to uh, the believers to the Christians uh, who visit this museum and that's the pieces of a marble inscription where the name of the Proconsul of Achaia is mentioned the famous Gallio or Gallio G-A-L-L-I-O who was there when Paul visited Corinth for the first time on the second missionary journey and that inscription is extremely important it's an important document because it's uh, <coughs> one of the few sources of information we have on the Apostle Paul's life and chronology in the sense that thanks to some of the events that are mentioned in that inscription, in that text, we're able to date that text. And if we can date the presence of Gallio in Corinth, we can date the presence of Paul in Corinth. If we can know when Gallio was in Corinth, we can know when Paul was in Corinth. So the scholars, the Bible scholars, who have been studying this inscription, this text for years and years now, have come to the conclusion that Paul, according to that text found here in Delphi, the Apostle Paul arrived in Corinth not earlier than the spring of 51 and no later than the spring of 53. That's what they believe, sorry, uh, not earlier than the spring of 50, 50, sorry, not 51, no later than the spring of 53. So uh, that's the linchpin in the chronology of the Apostle Paul's life. And when we know that, we count backwards and forwards, and that's how we can date the different events in Paul's life. That's why this inscription here in Delphi is extremely important. As you know, there's only a few sources of information, literary sources, to uh, provide information on Paul. It's, of course, the Book of Acts, his epistles, and this inscription that has been found in Delphi. So uh, that will be the last thing we see, and then we'll exit from the museum and uh, walk down the steps to get to our bus. I will show you in a minute where the bus is going to be, and we'll drive to the restaurant, which is on the way to Athens, and it's only like 10 minutes. It's arranged in a manner similar to the Greek letter Pi. So we start our visit from this side, go around, and exit from that side, from that uh, door that is on the left. So we will start at the end to see Galia's inscription, and then if you'd like to walk through the museum, you just walk back to this area and go this way. I will be with you, of course, to show you the painted reconstruction if you want to see it with me. And then you walk around and the, the pie, you follow the route of the, in the museum, and you exit from the right side. God bless you, God bless you, I can hear people sneezing. I don't see who it is, but God bless you, my friends. No. If you'd like to follow me and maybe form let's first form an open semicircle so that all of you can see if you don't mind my friends and then you'll have ample time to come closer one by one and take a picture and take a look but first allow me to point them out to you this is not an impressive find but it's so important you see pieces of a marble plaque 
that was set up on the side of the sacred way in the area of the sanctuary where we just came from. So people on their way up to the temple of Apollo, on their way to the oracle, would see this slab of marble on the side of the uh, sacred way and read the text. And the text, the text was really a letter of Claudius, the emperor Claudius, to the people of Delphi, telling them a number of things which are not important right now. The important thing is that in the lines of the text, we see the name of Galio, Galionos. It's in Greek, of course, and it's the possessive, the genitive of Galio. So, because of the other events mentioned in the text, we're able to date this letter, this text, and we know when Galileo was in Corinth, as I said, not earlier than 50, no later than 53. And then we come backward and forward, and we say that's when he took the second journey, that's when he took the third journey, and so on. So, Galionos, here it is. This is the important document. You'd like to share? Please, the please, this is probably the most important things. Of the, of, the, of the whole area. This is the most important thing. Without this, we would struggle very much about Paul's residence in Corinth. It's because of this we know exactly what this person is. So, so consider it serious. Sorry for interrupting. Of course, of course, go ahead. So, my friends, um, remember, we'll be walking around and you'll eventually exit, walk down from that side, see this again, and then you likes it from here. So I'll move to the other uh, side, the entrance of the collection. I'll be there to show you the painted the, uh, reconstruction when you show up, if you'd like to see. And keep in mind that if you try to start your visit from this side, they will not let you because the proper way to see the exhibition is starting the, the, the area where the entrance to the building is. So after you take a look at the Galio inscription and take a picture or two, you have to follow me this way in front. The detailed account of the travel writer Pausanias, whose name I mentioned earlier briefly, who described every single building, every statue, everything he saw here, he described in detail. So you see the little marketplace whose ruins were the first ones we saw? then people would enter the sacred precinct. This is the Athenian treasury that we have seen. They would go up this way. The rock of Sibyl was roughly here. They would go up. This was a pause altar. This is the serpent column that many of you asked about because you have seen a piece of the original one in Istanbul. The one that was here was a replica mm -hmm. to show you what the original used to look like. And you see how prominent Apollo's temple is uh, in the middle of this uh, composition. And the theater is just above here. That was a gigantic 30 feet tall statue of Apollo whose uh, donor sponsor remains unknown. They say it was gilded. So imagine, I mean, this place was full of un unbelievable treasures. Have they found that? No, no, not a piece. No metal pieces, very few metal pieces have been found because whenever there would be a war, the first thing that would disappear would be the gold and silver. They would melt it and turn it into money to get supplies or buy arts. And bronze and iron would be melted and turned into helmets and shields and daggers. So in these excavations, it's clay or uh, limestone or marble. Materials they had no use for. That's what we find. We have no idea. I'm sorry, we don't know the population of Delphi. We're assuming a few hundred because the area was flooded by pilgrims, by visitors, but the main population, the main permanent population was probably very small. And they were here just to make money off the visitors, really. It wasn't maybe a permanent town, a permanent settlement. So you go from here, my friends follow the rooms. And 220, yes. It's a very small museum. I think you can do it, my friends, in this time, in this semester.
amount of time? No, for many kilometers. Which is possible. And she was there on time. After the festivities had ended, they put a sleep inside that temple, exhausted, and they died at that time. That was the story of the Elves and the Kingdom, but again, not Egyptian. I know, I know. As I said, Greece copied each of the living But we have a few differences. Uh, probably you remember those black, those grand stuff in the region, looking like this. This is marble. We don't have grand in Greece. And during Greece, the artists, they were trying always to depict something that was much more realistic. Look at the face features, look at the lips, eyes wide open, look at the ears, look at the six pack of bones, kneecaps. Uh, these parts are new here, but the basis of original. And as I said, if you come closer, you can see even the descriptions. Another thing that uh, you must keep in mind ancient Greek statues were freestanding and they were perfectly carved all around, not just the front. There's no main side here. Every side is equally made, equally carved, and back then is equally painted. If you come and look at the back, you can see all the detail. So, remember, statues, there's big statues, you have to go all around them to see every side. Uh, it's a Greek word for statue. Ancient Greek, Roman Greek, it's the same, it is agalma. And, um, that means an item to make the gods rejoice. And for the gods to rejoice, they have been perfectly done all along. And you can see all the pictures that were taken the moment of the cover of these statues. And uh, they show that one of them was complete. They destroyed some of the pavement through the treasury of Athens. They removed those broken pieces and buried over there for centuries. They found all this. Hmm? Again, only because they were not that careful. First of all, look at this, please. A life-size statue of a bull. Mm -hmm. And when this was created in the 6th century BC, it was three leaves of silver, basically. Some golden details. When this was found, it was found in approximately 200 pieces. And the archaeologists spent three years, approximately, restoring this. They loved depicting bulls back then, because they, sh they thought that that animal uh, shows forces of nature and represents fertility. To create this, they were using back then the technique we still call nowadays the technique of the hidden wax. The idea is the core is a block of wood and then you cover everything with a thick layer of wax then on top of everything you add the hot metal. And uh, thanks to that layer of wax, the hot metal doesn't burn your wood. And then you add the sometimes golden details like here. As I said, this took them three years approximately. <laughs> and over there, over there at the center, you have fragments of three gold and ivory statues. That's the Holy Trinity of Delphi. As we are looking at the statues from left to right, the first face, that's Apollo, that's the god of Delphi, the god of light, music, and harmony. And then at the center, you can see his twin sister Artemis, Diana, the huntress, and the destroyed face that was the face of the mother of the twins, the titaness called Lito. Again, the core is a block of wood, only this time here. For the naked parts of the body, we have ivory, and then golden crowns, golden earrings hmm, for decoration. We never had mammals or elephants in Greece. So ivory was coming this way from Africa. And uh, back then, uh, they didn't know uh, any uh, sources of gold nearby. Today we know there is some gold here in Greece, but we keep on looking for more. We know back then gold was coming this way from Central Europe, from Central Europe, imagine this. Ivory over there is black, which means it was burned. Sixth century BC, it was burned. And uh, we know they had this theory, you don't remove holy items away from the holy area. Not even the destroyed statues. <laughs> Out of respect, they had to bury those fragments. Over there, where the archaeologists found them, in 1939, only because they were not there. 
But over there, those are masterpieces, if you ask me. Those are fantastic. If you look carefully, you can even go closer to Artemis and see her toenails. And look at the earrings she's wearing. Hmm? Pre classical statues. We will go further and reach now the classical part of the museum. Take your pictures over again because it was destroyed over and over again by the earthquake for heating the earthquake frequently. And on this side, we have statues depicting Apollo's arrival to Delphi. He came with horses and chariots. And then we have Stanley, the kings and the queens of Delphi, who received the god of light here. At the corners, we have animals not fighting each other really, even though that's how it looks like. They are playing with each other to show like that that even nature agreed. And uh, over there we have the other Lord of Delphi, Dionysus, Dionysus, Bacchus, mm -hmm. who usually is depicted bearded, but over there we have a clean shaven Dionysus, influenced by the iconography of Apollo. Look at the folds behind the belt over there. Uh, look at his hair. Look at the cheeks. Mm? These are classical statues. The art really shows. And I want you to always remember what we saw when we entered this museum. Mm? Those clay figurines, they look like nothing now compared to these statues. But my most favorite item in this museum is not a statue, really. It's a small drinking cup. I mean, since we mentioned Dionysus, in the next room, I will show you. Uh, it was watered wine, diluted always, because wine back then was different today. It was thick, sweet, and strong. And that's why they were always mixing one part wine with two, maybe three parts water. Not to get drunk like that, at least. <laughs> they thought it was something awful, almost barbaric, huh? getting drunk with straight up wine. Diluted was better. Over there, look at Apollo mm, as the god of Delphi, holding his lyre. He's the god of music, don't forget. And he's pouring red wine to the ground, libations, offerings like that. Uh, go a bit closer, please. Look at his sandals. Look at his hair. Look at the light he's holding. You can see every detail over there. It's fantastic. And uh, in front of Apollo, there's a black, black bird, right? What is that? What kind of bird is that? Huh? Crow. It's a crow. Mm -hmm. Yes, black, black crow. In the beginning, crows were white. The story goes like this. Once upon a time, Apollo fell in love with a mortal princess called Coronis. But Coronis was getting married to a mortal prince. She preferred a mortal prince to the kind of light. And that bird that was still white, brought the news about our wedding to Apollo, who felt extremely sad, and he cursed the bird. And since then, crows are black. Even though that crow was just a messenger. <laughs> now, the funny thing with pottery is that you can carbon date it and be very, very accurate. So this dates from the first quarter of the fifth century BC. This is a masterpiece, older even than the Parthenon. And, uh, it was found in pieces, but thankfully they discovered all of the fragments almost. And now we have this restored. We can see it in all its glory. But we have statues of his ancestors. You can always tell who was what by the way they are dressed or not dressed, the way they stand, the way they are gesturing. Naked boys, when they don't depict the gods, they depict at and uh, we know this one very, very well. The name is Aeneas. The name is written on the base. And think at, at Olympia, where they had the games over there. They love keeping records again. We have the records of the names of the Olympic winners. And in the fourth century BC, first half, we find the name Aeneas multiple times. He was arrested. Lightweight. And he was participating in this extreme wrestling event called Pakration. It was a combination of boxing and wrestling, and it was brutal. And in the beginning, there was only one rule. Rule one and only, there are no rules at all. Until the end. Until the end. Later only, they added, they established two rules. Rule number one, you don't kill your opponent. You don't kill your opponent. 
And rule number two, you don't take the eyes. Your opponents are not the sockets. They must have stayed there. Civilized things they tell us later. Olympic Games of the old. Uh, people who are gesturing like that guy over there, a politician or a philosopher giving a speech, a lesson. And people who wear heavy capes like this one here, military people, military leaders, generals. Here, of the 
guided. And that's why they believe that also the tripod had oracular powers and they uh, uttered their unintelligible utterings that only the priests uh, allegedly could understand and they were the ones who interpreted the oracle and wrote it down. So, as you, some of you pointed out, of course it was up to the priests to write down everything really that they wanted. Many explanations and theories have been, have, uh, been suggested. Uh, another one is that the priests of Apollo had a, an excellent network of spies all around Greece and they could know what was happening in most of the important cities in Greece at all times so they could give good uh, answers, let's say, good oracles to the uh, princes or kings or politicians and important people who came to the oracle. But uh, the survey, as I mentioned, uh, that took place um, led to the conclusion that the Pythia inhaled ethylene. So there's a lot uh, uh, that you have asked, you have asked many questions. Let me quickly say something about the charioteer. The bronze charioteer that you had the chance to see in the last room is a very famous piece. It's the pride, the star piece of this museum because it was the first life-size intact bronze statue that was found in the world. In the, uh, it was found in the 19th century when the excavation started and it's one of the best preserved classical bronze statues in the world. The date is 476 before Christ. So, uh, this is a busy place because it's a great place. Don't let the uh, us, uh, north of Athens. And uh, this is the most narrow part of the town. Oh, oh my! about two, two and a half hours away from Athens, so we need 
to get you to the hotel at some point during the day today. So my friends, I will uh, not go on, of course. I just wanted to tell you about this town, which is uh, very, very well known, very famous. It's the town of uh, Rakhovo. And of course, we continue our descent from the mountain range of Parnassus. And I'll let you rest and enjoy the ride. And I'll be back when it will be time to Thank you. 